Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Was America once socialist? Surprisingly, yes. The settlers who arrived at Jamestown in the early 1600s experimented with socialist communes. Did it work? Two history professors join us to share the fascinating story. Americans didn't invent free market capitalism, but you might say they perfected it. In doing so, they created more wealth for more people than any society in the history of the world. To begin to understand this fascinating and complex story, we have to travel back in time to the very first settlers of America. But before we get to the history, let me define what I mean by capitalism. It's not an easy term to pin down because it developed over thousands of years of human interaction. Adam Smith, the great English thinker, first described it in his famous 1776 treatise, The Wealth of Nations, but he didn't invent it. For our purposes here, I define capitalism as an economic system in which individuals freely decide what they will produce and who they will serve. Since both parties have to consent, it's a system in which success demands that you serve the needs of others before you are rewarded for your work. Now back to history. When the first settlers arrived at Jamestown in 1607, then Plymouth in 1620, they were operating under an economic system common to all European nations at that time known as mercantilism. Under mercantilism, businesses, especially in the colonies, were operated for the benefit of the state. While governments permitted the companies to make profits, their primary purpose was to advance the national interest of England or Spain or France. The early American settlements were set up to be self-sufficient so that the English government didn't have to support them and they had to stake out territory. That was key to the colonial game. If England held the territory, Spain and France didn't. The early colonists began their adventure with what they thought was a beautiful idea. They set up a common storehouse of grain from which people were supposed to take what they needed and put back what they could. Lands were also held in common and were worked in common. The settlers owned no land of their own. Though there was no name for this system, it was an ideal socialist commune. And you can probably guess what happened. It began to fall apart almost immediately. As the colonists learn, when everyone is entitled to everything, no one's responsible for anything. A colonist who started his workday early or stayed late received the same provision of food as a colonist who showed up late, went home early, or didn't work at all. After about two years, the settlement was reduced to eating shoelaces and rats. Half of them died of starvation. Captain John Smith, of Pocahontas fame, took control of the colony and scrapped a socialist model. Each colonist received his own parcel of land. Private property had come to the New World. He who won't work, won't eat, Smith told them, citing the biblical admonition. Well, they worked, and they ate, and the colony was saved. The same story unfolded further north, in the Plymouth Colony, ten years later. Although this was a Puritan colony with religious goals, its plan was the same as Jamestown's, and it also failed. As its young governor, William Bradford, noted, by adopting the communal system, we thought we were wiser than God. So they quickly abandoned the commune for private ownership. Soon they had an abundance, which they celebrated with a holiday we now know as Thanksgiving. Over the next 150 years, this hard-learned lesson that men should be responsible for their own economic fate became conventional wisdom in the colonies. The American Revolution was largely fought over the burden that British mercantilism placed on the colony. Two unpopular taxes, the Stamp Act and the Tea Act, are well-known examples. The Americans saw the British government regulating and controlling almost all of their economic activities and didn't like it. Now, it's true that even after gaining independence, none of the founders could be called capitalists. The idea of capitalism as a description of an economic system was only just beginning to be discussed in America. Yet many of the most influential founders intuitively gravitated toward free market principles. Thomas Jefferson's ideas of private land ownership shaped the famous land ordinance of 1785 that made public land available to private citizens. While Alexander Hamilton's concepts of individual responsibility and sanctity of contracts could be seen in the Panic of 1791-92, in which he steadfastly refused to allow the U.S. government to bail out bankers who had triggered the panic. 
Benjamin Franklin, of course, had practiced capitalism all his life with his printing business and with his maxims in Poor Richard's Almanac. The Constitution itself is awash in core concepts of a free market, sanctity of contracts, freedom of expression, powerful limits on the government's ability to regulate or tax, an emphasis on paying debts, and so on. In short, it was the wisdom of experience, not academic ideology, that created America's free market principles. The result has been the most prosperous and free nation in the history of the world. I'm Larry Swikart of the University of Dayton. The United States is the world's most prosperous economy. It's been that way for so long, over a hundred years, that we take it for granted. But how did it happen? There are many answers, of course. One is that the United States values the free market over government control of the economy. But here's a point that is seldom made. It didn't begin that way. Before the country placed its trust in the free market, it trusted the government to make important business decisions. Or to put it another way, only after the government failed repeatedly to promote economic growth and only after private enterprise succeeded where the government failed did the United States start to develop a world-beating economy. Let's look at three telling examples. In 1808, John Jacob Astor formed the American Fur Company and marketed American furs around the world. Europeans adored beaver hats for their peerless warmth and durability. Astor gave them what they wanted. Instead of leaving the fur business to capable entrepreneurs like Astor, the government decided it wanted to be in on the action. So it subsidized its own fur company run by a self-promoting government official named Thomas McKinney. McKinney should have won the competition. After all, he had the federal government backing him. But while Astor employed hundreds of people and still made a tidy profit, McKinney's company lost money every year. Finally, Congress, in 1822, came to its senses and ended the subsidies for McKinney and his associates. A similar situation developed in the 1840s around the telegraph. The telegraph was the first step toward the instant communication we have today. Invented by Samuel Morse, the telegraph transmitted sound as dots and dashes representing letters of the alphabet. Morse, more of an idealist than a businessman, agreed to let the government own and operate the telegraph in the national interest. But the government steadily lost money each month it operated the telegraph. During 1845, expenditures for the telegraph exceeded revenue by 6 to 1 and sometimes by 10 to 1. Seeing no value in the invention, Congress turned the money loser over to private enterprise. In the hands of entrepreneurs, the business took off. Telegraph promoters showed the press how it could instantly report stories occurring hundreds of miles away. Bankers, stockbrokers, and insurance companies saw how they could instantly monitor investments near and far. As the quality of service improved, telegraph lines were strung across the country from 40 miles of wire in 1846 to 23,000 miles in 1852. By the 1860s, the U.S. had a transcontinental telegraph wire. And by the end of that decade, entrepreneurs had strung a telegraph cable across the Atlantic Ocean. Why didn't the U.S. government profitably use what Morse had invented? Part of the answer is that the incentives for bureaucrats differ sharply from those of entrepreneurs. When government operated the telegraph, Washington bureaucrats received no profits from the messages they sent. And the cash they lost was the taxpayers, not their own. So government officials had no incentive to improve service, to find new customers, or to expand to more cities. But entrepreneurs like Ezra Cornell, the founder of Western Union, did. Cheaper, better service meant more customers and more profits. Just 15 years after Congress privatized the telegraph, both the costs of construction and the rates for service linking the major cities were as little as one-tenth of the original rates established by Washington. In the steamship business, we see the story repeated yet again. During the 1840s, regular steamship travel began between New York and England. 
The government placed its bets on shipowner Edward Collins, a man more skilled at political lobbying than at business. While Congress funded Collins, Cornelius Vanderbilt started his own steamship company. Vanderbilt cut the costs of travel, filled his ships with eager passengers, and built a fabulously successful business, soon leaving Collins in his wake. Collins failed because he didn't feel a need to improve or even provide safe and regular service. For example, two of his four ships sank, killing hundreds of passengers. If he lost money, there was always another politician to appeal to. Vanderbilt, in contrast, had to serve his customers or he would have lost his company. You'd think we would have learned our lesson by now. Economic prosperity comes from free enterprise, not from government subsidies. But it's a lesson we have to learn every generation. I'm Burton Folsom, professor of history at Hillsdale College. I'm Mark Vinette. And I hope you're enjoying the ride.